Welcome to the Thriving Mayor Show, conversations with people making the biggest difference in the quality of living in our towns and cities, including former and current mayors and other special guests. Each interview features their wisdom, unique perspective, stories, and experiences shared in a casual conversation. Join us and comment on social media as we meet another leader in the life of our urban places. Hello, everyone. It's Michael Hubicki, the host of The Thriving Mayor Show, and it's October 6, 2021, uh, episode 34, and I'm extremely fortunate and happy and honored today to have as our special guest, author and former City of London, Ontario Councillor, Gord Hume. Hello, Gord. How are you good, today? Good morning, Michael. How are you? Great, great. Thank you very much. So just so everyone knows, this is a pre-recorded session. It's uh, the day after the Canadian federal election. So we're going to chat a little bit about that, uh, but mostly about Gord's uh, city building and uh, and leadership uh, experience and, uh, and knowledge uh, uh, during the show. But uh, definitely want to uh, to talk a little bit about the election. The morning after the night before. Exactly. We see many, many of those. Yes. Yeah. I'll begin this episode by honoring the land and the indigenous peoples who've lived here from the beginning. I'm grateful for the opportunity to live here, which is the Bay of Quinte, and thank all the generations of people who have taken care of this land for thousands of years. In particular, I honor the ancestors of the land, the Anishinaabek and the Haudenosaunee peoples, and this territory is covered by the 1783 Crawford Purchase. So, Gord, thank you, thank you so much for uh, ag agreeing to be a guest on the show. Um, uh, in preparation uh, for for the interview, I've I've been reading uh, this book, which is from 2016, The yes. Crisis. Uh, but also looking at your other uh, body of work, I think there's five more books. Uh, six, actually. Uh, six. Okay. Seven all together. Yeah. So I'll give I'll give our our, uh, our viewers a quick. Uh, bio that I cobbled together for you. Gord is one of Canada's most respected commentators on local mm -hmm. government issues and a sought after keynote speaker for conferences and municipalities around the world. An entrepreneur, four term city of councillor, city councillor in London, Ontario, and successful business leader, Gord breaks his unique, own unique leadership perspective 21st century city building. He's the author of seven books on, great, on building great communities and has been a keynote speaker in Europe, United States, New Zealand, Korea, and across Canada. On today's show, we're gonna chat about three uh, emerging issues that will influence government leadership in the future, the lack of municipal recognition by federal con constitution and government, problem of lack of taxation for cities, and the need to reform government's, governance models for cities. So Gord is the fifth author on The Thriving Mayor Show, and has an immense wealth of knowledge and experience about town building and municipal government. Gord, any surprises in last night's federal election? Uh, I was actually on the record, Michael, uh, well in advance of saying it was going to be an echo parliament. By that I meant the same thing, and that's exactly what has happened. Yeah. I have not yet figured out any winners from last night's election at all. I don't think any of the leaders particularly won or distinguished themselves. Yeah. I don't think any of the parties particularly achieved anything very momentous. Uh, obviously, you know, you congratulate the local candidates and, and I've been there and any time you win an election, it's a great thing and God bless, but um, it's, it, elections are so brutal these days. It's just an awful experience. Yeah. But overall for Canada, I am not seeing any particular changes or big differences coming or major policy initiatives. Uh, I, I, I'm concerned that, that once again we are treading water in Canada. Uh, I, I, I'm very concerned about how we move this country forward in a in uh, how we support innovation, how we support creativity, how we encourage entrepreneurship. And a lot of that starts at the local level, but it needs that federal support. It needs that umbrella as a nation to move ahead on those things. And I'm still not seeing that, Michael, and that disappoints me greatly. Yeah, me too. And so, so well said. Thank you very much for that. 
And it's, uh, but in your book, you're very, very clear that, uh, that things happen at the municipal level, things happen with strong, uh, visionary, uh, magnetic municipal leadership. And, and that's what we want to talk about today. And that uh, it's from the bottom up, the grassroots up, where uh, where we can we could really start to uh, create some momentum, which we're already creating in our communities. But to, but to, con to continue to do that, I, I have argued for for a number of years in both when I was in office and and in my writings and my speeches all over that for most people and most businesses most of the time. Local government is the most important order of government. And people are always quite shocked by that until I start to think it through. And <laughs> certainly my, my, my friends in the federal and provincial governments get snarly with me when I tell them that. But I, I believe it to be true. I think it's the reality. Yeah. When you look at the importance of local government, what we do at the local level, the environment that we set, the conditions that we have, you know, uh, and, and this is what local mayors and councillors do. And that is what creates the foundation, the support for this entrepreneurial spirit. Yeah. But again, as a nation, we are not doing that energetically and, and forcefully. And again, with this pablum, you know, government and, 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 and parliament that, that we have apparently elected again, <laughs> I'm just not seeing anybody really striding forward and saying, this is what we have to do. This is how we're going to move it. Let's get on with it. Yeah. And there's going to be the usual backbiting and backstabbing and back whatever else goes on in Ottawa. Uh, and I think a lot of people are tired of it. I think they're weary yeah. of this lack of initiative and, and moving forward by uh, the parliament and, frankly, often by legislature. In, in some of the provinces and territories. Yeah. And I, I, I think people in Canada want to get on. I think they're, they're hungry for entrepreneurial spirits. I think they're hungry for accomplishments. I think they want to support their local uh, business people and, and, and union leaders and all the, the smart entrepreneurs who want to move on and get forward. And sometimes there's reluctance to do that. And sometimes there isn't the environment in which to do that. Mm -hmm. And those are the, some of the obstacles we have to overcome. Yeah, yeah. So, so true. So changing gears a little bit, Gord, uh, visiting your website, which is the gordhume.com, the, like the, you've got a whole bunch of photos that scroll across the top. And <laughs> you have done a ton of travel. Yes, I have. And, yeah. and uh, some really, really interesting places, the Great Wall of China, uh, into yeah. Korea, uh, all, you know, the Pacific, Asia Pacific, uh, North America, Europe. What, what, uh, what was your favorite place to go as a tourist? As a tourist? Well, because I tend to like to explore cities and their history and their people and their culture and so on. Um, I really like Melbourne, Australia. Oh, okay. They've done a wonderful job of changing the culture of that city. Uh, they plant, Michael, 3,000 trees a year just in their downtown to make it, you know, more appealing and provide greater shade. Yeah. I find Istanbul a very interesting city. Wow. Uh, before the current president there, perhaps. <laughs> Yeah. Um, but the history and the culture. So I think it was Napoleon many years ago who said, if, if the world was a country, Istanbul would be its capital. Oh, cool. Isn't that interesting? Isn't that a great statement? Yeah. I, uh, I, I visited uh, Istanbul in 1987. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, backpacking. Yeah. And it was, it yeah. was spectacular. We were, yeah. we were going to go for a couple of days and stayed a week. Yeah, I absolutely believe that. You know, you have lunch in Asia, dinner in Europe. I mean, what a neat, you know, but the history and the Grand Bazaar, yeah. uh, the, the culture of the, the city. I, so I find that Paris, it's impossible not to love. Yeah. Just the walkability of the city, how they have rebuilt it, the uh, history, the elegance. Uh, I find Paris a very interesting city. 
Um, the Asian cities, Seoul in South Korea, Beijing, Shanghai, Hong Kong, well, Hong Kong before the last year or two was a really dynamic city. Yeah. The food, the culture, the business, the people. Um, Beijing is fascinating to me. When I was there a few years ago, they were starting to build, I think it was their eighth ring road. Oh, wow. Their eighth. Yeah. And they had plans for 12. I mean, that's <laughs> what they're doing. Um, in Shanghai, I rode on the maglev train that went 431 kilometers an hour. And my cup of tea didn't quiver. That's remarkable infrastructure. Wow. What they have spent in China on, on elevating infrastructure, we should dream about. I think it's a, it's a continental embarrassment that we do not have one kilometer of high-speed rail in North America. I, I just think that's tragic on so yeah. many different levels. Um, taking you know the, the political thing out of it you know, with China, you have to admire what they have done as a nation in building their infrastructure, beautiful airports, modern highways, high-speed rail. Uh, you know, so there are a lot of things that, that, that I like about China, I like about Asia. I found Thailand interesting. Um, a lot of problems in Thailand. Uh, there are some endemic problems in right. Thailand that, that uh, they have to finish. I like New, New Zealand a lot. Uh, Auckland, uh, a friend of mine was helping to rejuvenate the city. Uh, and uh, so I gave a speech at City Hall a few years ago, and they've done some very interesting neighborhoods and, and rebuilding their cities and so on. So those are some of the places that I like. My yeah, life. outstanding. And uh, Gord, where did you grow up? And, uh, and I, I, grew, I grew up in Saskatoon. Saskatoon? Yeah, Saskatchewan. Yeah, okay. My parents and grandparents were... Uh, prairie settlers many yeah. years ago. My grandfather was a veterinarian who, of course, went bankrupt in the Depression in Saskatchewan in the 30s. Wow. Sold the last cow on the farm, apparently, and that paid to my father's uh, tuition to normal school, which is what they call teacher's college in those days. Okay. And he spent then his career in education. And I grew up in Saskatoon, yeah. And and uh, and back in those days, did you uh, did you did you know that you were going to be uh, getting so involved in politics? And uh, do you know I, I I I did. Um, I, I I was taking political science in university, and got very lucky. A uh, local radio station hired me. Well, didn't hire me. I they didn't pay me for the summer, <laughs> but. Um, uh, let me be, a, I guess, an intern is what we call it today. They really liked what I was doing over the summer. They offered me a job as a reporter that fall. Oh, that's cool. Paying me $65 a week for a lot of hours. Yeah. Uh, my ambition was to earn $10,000 in a year. I couldn't imagine I could spend that much money in your life. Uh, I later figured that out, but that's another story. Yeah. Uh, and uh, shortly after they hired me in the news department, they assigned me to cover City Hall. Wow. And Saskatoon in those days had a wonderful mayor named Sid Buckold. Uh, it would mean something to people in that area. It wouldn't necessarily mean. He should have been Canada's finance minister. He ran uh, with Lester Pearson and... Uh, for an MP, and the people didn't vote him in Saskatoon because they wanted to keep him as mayor. Oh. They didn't want to lose him to Ottawa, which was very <laughs> interesting. And uh, Mr. Buckwold ran a wonderful city hall, city council, very forward thinking. He was into land banking. What year was that, Gord? 68, 9, that sort of thing. Right. And that was just after Pierre Trudeau had taken off. So I got to cover Pierre Trudeau. I got to meet him several times. Yeah. And he was very gracious to me, I have to tell you. Yeah. And I covered the uh, the Trudeau tractor demonstration in Saskatoon, the famous riot that they had. The first political speech ever covered was Tommy Douglas. Wow. In the 67 Saskatchewan election of the Besborough Hotel. And I never covered a political speech before in my life. Yeah. And... Uh, 
Tommy Douglas came into the ballroom to the applause that was jammed to the rafter, took his wristwatch off, put it on the podium, and for his one hour speech, spoke for 59 minutes and 59 seconds without a note. Wow. And had them dancing on the ceiling. And that was my first political speech ever covered. I've never forgotten it. And he and I actually became very good friends. His mother was living in Saskatoon, so whenever he would come in uh, to see her, uh, he would be at the airport. And in those days, party leaders didn't have big entourages. Yeah. And several times, I would meet him at the airport for an interview and then drive him to the nursing home. Wow. Home. And I uh, say so we, we, we became friends. Yeah. And I, many years ago, I did a, uh, a one-hour special radio show on the indigenous populations in Saskatchewan and their treatment and went up to Batoche with the rebellion and so on. And uh, Tommy Douglas was, gave me an interview about the treatment of the Canadian Indian. That's what they were called in those days. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I've never forgotten the line. And I started the, my, my program off with it. He said, the treatment of the Canadian Indian is the blackest page in Canadian history. Never forgotten the line. And that's how I started the radio program. So that was my background in, in broadcasting and getting started. That wasn't and, uh, all in one year, in one summer, though, was it? No, no, no. That oh. was that was over two or three years. Okay. Well, and, wow, uh, what what an indoctrination. Well, it, it really was because I think that fall we had a Saskatchewan election, and then I think we had a federal election, and I'm getting to cover these things and talk to prime ministers and yeah. premiers, and it was a lot different from what my political science professor was trying to tell me. Oh so yeah, yeah. That's that's how my background was. That would have been a great thesis or a practicum topic. Yeah, uh, yeah, master's yeah, degree or in uh, yeah. poli sci. But yeah, yeah. And, yeah. and so what? What was the pivotal point or or uh, uh, a role model that uh, kind of got launched you into uh, into municipal politics? Well, I had always remembered um, Saskatoon City Council and City Hall and Mayor Buckle. And I always had a great interest uh, in, in local government. Just when I was in business, I was president of some radio stations and so on. And in London, um, I, I was living here for a number of years and finally realized I didn't like how city council was operating my city. And I figured I could do one of three things. I could, I could bitch about it, I could do nothing, or I could do something about it. Or move. Well, it seemed extreme to me, but yes. Uh, so I made a decision to run for city council. Wow, that's awesome. And didn't know what I was doing, had, had no idea. Uh, and to the shock and horror of many people, I got elected. <laughs> uh, and I got elected four times in London. And uh, like to think that I, I left a better city than when I started. Yeah, yeah. I was pretty involved in... Uh, the library system, for example, that was a wonderful pet project of mine. Uh, I think public libraries are one of the best things city councils can do to spend tax dollars. So I was able to kind of drive uh, a major uh, upgrade and renovation of the library system, which frankly needed it at that time. And then I had, and I came up with an idea for building a new central library in London which involved buying a former Bay store downtown that was vacant. Yeah. And we bought it and turned it into a new central library, which has been a fabulous success. Beautiful, beautiful. Yeah. So so your your firm right now is called Hube Communication. And I'm wondering the the uh, the your first or, or your your uh, counselor campaigning and is that sort of where the communication part of it started? And obviously you gotta be a great communicator. Then be a politician but uh, yeah so what's the tie-in with uh, with politics and then your craft now i actually started the company in the 1980s oh, okay. uh, as a consulting firm and that's what i was doing to help other corporations right so i'd like to say that, that it was some deep dark political thing but no it was just blind <laughs> dumb luck <laughs> no so take us back to your first campaign 
You said you didn't. You didn't. Uh, uh, didn't have a clue what I was doing. And uh, because I, uh, I had moved to London several years before that, I didn't have local family. I didn't have, yeah. you know, the, the high school network that most people do. But I was just kind of out on my own and people started coming to me. And I built a, 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 a kind of a network and then realized that, gee, you got to do more than put a couple of signs up and print a brochure. You actually got to get out and hand them out. So I started knocking on doors, and that was a great revelation because I don't know, Mike, if you were knocked on doors in the campaign or not. But no, 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 no. You should you should do it sometime. It's an experience. You you learn to put one foot on the screen door so that when the crazed dog inside comes charging through the hallway to yeah. bite your butt off, yeah. you can hold it. Um, you you learn to um, be discreet when people are answering the door because they are not necessarily expecting yes. uh, visitors at that time. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and you learn how exhausting campaigns are. Yeah. Climbing all the stairs and walk, pounding the streets and walking from door to door, uh, doing door, you know, waving at, at intersections and all the idiot things you say, I'll never do that. <laughs> you do. And you build a support group with you and uh I, I i led the polls in my ward in that election wow congratulations so so yeah. it wasn't a close election then your, your result your oh it was close oh was it but i led i won At the end of the day that's all that mattered yeah but yeah it there were nine people running in the ward wow that's yeah. a lot yeah yeah huh well, congratulations! And then, did, were, were, were you were, were there elections uh, the next three, or was there any? Uh, oh yes! Oh, I, I never got a claim. And, and the next three, I ran citywide. Uh, London in those days had uh, what's called a board of control. Yes. Which were four people elected citywide plus the mayor, and we we uh, were really the executive committee of city council. So you, after one term as a ward councillor, then moved citywide and got elected three times there awesome. and and i enjoyed that because that let me deal with bigger issues broader yeah. issues yeah not just ward stuff but uh you know we did the budget we did the strategic planning for the city all of those things yeah and uh, i really enjoyed that from a from a broader perspective yeah one of the first guests on the show was anna and reed the chico best oh yeah it was a yeah. multi-term mayor of london yeah. and that's how she yeah. started she started as the yeah. youngest counselor and then her yeah. next election she said i gotta i think she knows she went to deputy mayor which is which is also a board of control board of control yeah. and then she went yeah. to mayor yeah yeah and yeah. uh sure. and, and loved it so it's, yeah she and i worked together on council several years oh fantastic yeah yeah yeah, yeah. She and uh, I noticed that your uh, by some of your photos, you were you were speaking at Brescia College, which she's a professor at as well. I think she is. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Did you ever think about or consider running for mayor? Yeah, and and the timing just wasn't right. Okay. Uh, and the timing had to be right. And at the after four terms, people wanted me to run for mayor. And Michael, I'll be very honest with you. Uh, very few politicians figure out when it's time to go. And most political careers end in tears or losses or political humiliation or something. And that's not me. It just, it wasn't me. I, I, I never believed politics should be a career. Yeah. You should get in, work hard, make your contributions, and then, frankly, get out. Uh, let the next generation come in, younger, smarter, faster people. Yeah. And uh, after four terms, I was tired. Um, and you've got to have the fire in your belly. And at that point, I had had enough. I had had four terms, or however many years that is, yeah. Uh, of, of public life. Uh, and that had affected 
uh, a relationship that I had at, at the time. Yeah. And uh, the woman involved didn't like being in the public life and didn't like my being in there and being skewered by the London Free Press on a regular basis and so on. And they didn't like me at all. They really didn't like me. No. Um, and it, it gets tiring. Oh, yeah. It yeah. just gets tiring. You know the one. Th you know the th you know what really used to drive me crazy, were the phone calls at home on a Sunday night. You know you, the, the council meetings were Mondays, and people thought if they could call you at home on Sunday night, they would really influence your vote. Well, they didn't know me very well, wow. but they would do it, and it used to make me nuts. You know. So anyway, I I I like to think I left a much better city than than when I came to city council. Yeah. I was one of the people driving the building of the John Labatt Center, which was our new downtown arena in those days, which has transformed a lot of London. Huge success. Huge, huge success. Yeah, yeah. So those are the things you feel good about and yeah. contributions that you have made. But again, I, I, I'm a, I've I, become a believer in term limits for yeah. elected people. Mm. Uh, I and, and I wasn't initially. And you know it's easy to buy into. Oh well, let, let the public decide. Uh, they're all in there. I got to tell you, I have seen on councils, not just London, but on councils that I've looked at and worked with, uh, people who are going for their you know eighth term on city council. Well, frankly, they haven't had a fresh idea in twelve years, and they don't want to get out. I guess they like. The ego and the bit of the money and the prestige or whatever, but um, my view has become: if you haven't done what you're going to do in three, four-year terms, get up or get out. Yeah, one or the other. If you want to run for mayor, whatever, fine. If you've been mayor for twelve years, time to move on. Thank you for your service. You know, we'll have a nice dinner for you. Goodbye. Uh, because you need fresh blood coming into city councils all the time. Yeah, you need new leadership. You know, the yeah. city needs to uh, have have that that different thinking, those different eyes involved. Yeah, and speaking of which, Gord, if if I could just interject here with with uh, with your book, and uh, and I'm just reading through it, but one of my favorite chapters is chapter three. And that's where you do the leadership survey across Canada. I think you had almost 1,500 respondents, which is yeah. almost unheard of yeah. survey. So that's a, a huge uh, cross section yeah. uh, through which you can make some very informed uh, assessments. And and you talk about new ideas and and leadership, which to me really kind of boils down to our vision, and and not our platform. Not like we want to we want to hold taxes, yeah. we want to pay potholes. Yeah. But the vision. So, what's that big, compelling, magnetic vision? And I was really intrigued by the results. Where um, the it said here, uh, rank ethics and vision as the two most important leadership qualities. Yet, rank the top two leadership challenges as vision and decisiveness. Sure. So, uh, they have to have vision, but the one of the most uh, biggest challenge is, is the vision. Yeah. And then they go from top of ethics to the second most is decisiveness. Yeah. So it really shows that it's that the the 1500 people that you surveyed, it's not just your opinion or my opinion, but this is common in, in 2016 across Canada that that our leaders have to be visionary. And and I think it was the first time anything like that was ever done in Canada. Yeah. And the results, I think, startled a lot of people um, because it showed the differences uh, often between the needs and wants and, and abilities of your elected people and the needs, wants, abilities of your appointed staff people. Yeah. And how frequently those did not come together, did not mm -hmm. mesh together. Yeah. And that's why uh, communication inside City Hall was also such a critical element for uh, particularly staff. Uh, they often didn't know what the counselors were going to do or why they were going to do it. 
So yeah. it's very hard for them to then implement policies yeah. uh, if they're if they're not on side with that sort of thing. So I thought it was a really interesting chapter, and I think a very useful um, contribution to municipal dialogue in this country. And I think now that even even more so with social media, the lack of of uh, uh, local newspapers and, and kind of objective yeah. uh, broadcasting or reporting of things like that, that that uh, the, and sound bites and and things that the little uh, nuggets of of uh, content have to capture your imagination or your attention or your drama, and uh, it's it's everything is just is so much more magnified now. And you, you raise Michael such an important point, and I've been arguing this for a long time because communications was my business uh, for four decades. Um, we are losing local media voices. Mm -hmm. We are losing that scrutiny of our town and city councils. And I don't know how we're going to get that back. But increasingly, you have communities that do not have a daily or a weekly newspaper. Yeah. Radio stations locally do not cover local events and do newscasts the way they once did. Local television newscasts are in very serious jeopardy. Mm -hmm. They've been cut back and cut back. Mm -hmm. yeah. And they might do one story on the city council uh, meeting, but that's it. And, you know, the reality is elected people need some outside scrutiny. They need to know that there are outside eyes looking at what they are doing. Because sometimes, frankly, they're doing things that are wrong. That are not very helpful to the community or mm -hmm. whatever and i i really worry where our uh, local media is going to go mm -hmm. and how people will get accurate unbiased information in the future then the information not the crap you get on the internet yeah um but that information and then yes the interpretation of that mm -hmm. you know what does it mean you know, how will it affect the community? Yeah. What are the future, you know, situations you're going to be dealing with? And we're losing that. And it's a big, big problem in this country. Yeah. And your experience, Gord, have you, uh, do you recall a mayor, say, with a with a really strong vision that used that as part of the, the catalyst for their their election and then was able to maintain that and that vision was was instrumental in, in developing that more you know a positive or or better quality of living in oh sure yeah. oh yeah yeah i i think many successful mayors uh in fact um i, I i've always believed that you need to be able to express in a campaign concisely uh, why you're running and what you're going to do mm -hmm. because elections to me should be about the future yeah. and how are you going to make the city, the province, the country better. And I think that was one of the big problems in the federal election last night is that after a month of listing, uh, I don't know why they were running and I don't know what they're going to do for me. Yeah. You know, other than they're trying to give a lot of money away and that to me is not always the answer. Yeah. I never got a great vision of the country from any of them. Yeah. And I think that was a weakness. I think people instinctively sense that and, and they react to that. Um, so yeah, I, I think successful mayor and, and counselor need to be able to say, this is what I want to do. This is where we need to go. And this is how I'm going to help us get there. And I think when they do that, I think it becomes a much stronger election campaign and also then presumably you're you're elected you can then say i have a mandate to do that i have an obligation to try to accomplish that mm -hmm. uh instead of all this this wishy-washy oh well i don't know maybe we should but well, there's decisive the right decisive yeah yeah you, you don't have yeah. that vision to to be your benchmark yeah. your yeah. you know your, yeah. your rule your ruler uh, not ruler and, and uh, yeah. but to yeah. make your, your yeah. Yes. yeah. But also the other thing on that I would argue is we also need to think bigger thoughts in local government. Yeah. 
Um, too often we get caught up in, do we need the garbage collected every seventh day or every eighth day? Well, let's move on. We can figure that out. That's why you have smart staff. Uh, I have always believed that, that you need a greater vision. Mm. And you need to talk about bigger issues. This is why I get so frustrated with local government in this country. Because they all sit around the bar at their conferences. I've been there, trust me. And bitch about how they don't have enough taxation authority and how they can't raise enough money. And they're right. But then they don't do anything about it. Yeah. They don't make it election issues. They don't, in a federal election, they don't, you know, get the, the candidates in front of them at City Hall and line them up and say, this is the problem. What are you going to do about it? How are you going to help us fix this? Yeah. This is why I keep arguing that the way we finance local governments these days is, is inadequate, always has been, and always will be. The property tax system is not the way to fund uh, thriving, creative, prosperous cities. It just can't be done. So we need to change the tax system. We need to change the relationship between federal and provincial and municipal governments. We need to change that, that uh, provincial conflict, paternalistic viewpoint of how to deal with towns and cities, which just drives me crazy. Yeah. And that goes back to the, the NA Act, the Constitution, where it said municipalities got seven words, count seven words, which basically said provinces, you get the cities. Good luck. Didn't say it quite that way, but that was, you know. But in those days, 150 years ago, what were cities, you know? Yeah. A couple of thousand smelly guys in beaver pelts sitting around having a drink, you know, I mean, who matter? Yeah. Nowadays, um, I can make a pretty good argument that of all the, the, the westernized uh, nations, Canada's treatment by its federal government of municipalities is arguably the worst. We don't provide adequate, sufficient, or regular funding to right. cities because the feds hide behind the province say, oh no, it's your responsibility. The province, you know, the, the, one of the great phrases that makes me bang my head into the nearest wall is when provincial government or ministers come along and say, we just want to be your partners. Bang. <laughs> because no, you don't. Yeah. You don't care about city. Yeah. And it's only when you get, for example, in Alberta, Calgary and Edmonton working together that they got a charter. When you get the city of Toronto and Ontario uh, demanding and finally getting a little bit more power than other cities have. But then what about Ottawa, Hamilton, London? You know, why aren't they entitled to those kinds of things? Yeah, yeah. Um, but you, it, so people say to me when I give my speeches and so on, you know, if you can't, finance through property tax, how are you going to do it? And to me, the answer is very simple, consumption tax. And uh, in one of my books, uh, Taking Back Our Cities, I think, um, Paul Martin and I, and Paul was very gracious to me uh, with long talks. And he agrees that municipalities need better federal funding. Yeah, But he also made the point that that can be done by the provinces without having a big constitutional battle. Because the last thing you want to do in Canada is open a constitutional battle. Yeah. Um, and we actually have an example now. <clears throat> Saskatchewan, in 2011, became the first province to share one cent of its sales tax with its municipalities. Wow. So it can be done. The other provinces just haven't had the courage or the vision to do it, but it can be done. And Saskatchewan, my home province, God bless them, was the first to come up with that. So if you did that, and I, I, I developed a model in, in the book where and I'm, it's been a while, so forgive me if I'm not totally, but if you got 1% of federal tax revenue in from your city, 
and one cent of the provincial sales tax paid in your city. You could reduce property taxes by almost 20%, 20%, have the same net amount of money coming in the first year of the city. And then presumably consumption taxes would simply grow as they tend to in the future with people spending mm -hmm. uh, money. Yeah. And that's the model. Yeah. And it makes all kinds of sense, but nobody's got the courage to really push it forward. And but to me, that's a kind of big idea we should be talking about in local elections that we are not. Yeah. So so then, Gord, with the with the uh, impetus for moving that forward fall on local municipal governments or like who, who has to champion that? I, I think local governments have to champion it because they're the ones who will ultimately benefit and they're the ones to whom it is most directly impact the provinces won't do it because the provinces just look down on towns and cities uh they are third-rate bothers i mean what municipal affairs minister in the province has ever risen to success you know it's a bad portfolio uh the feds I'm trying to remember, I have a vague recollection in the late 60s, early 70s, there actually was a federal ministry of urban affairs or something like that. Oh, sounds familiar, yeah. Yeah, but it's it, it didn't last. So the feds had really nothing to do. Well, it's CMAP and, as well. I don't know if that's... Yeah, but the, the problem is the feds um, tend to only do infrastructure projects when it's good for them. Yeah. not when it's good for municipalities. <clears throat> and then they come barreling along in a panic, throwing billions of dollars around, but saying in, in a phrase that is terrifying to me, we need shovel-ready projects. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is why a few years ago, we ended up building gazebos in backyards instead of bridges across rivers. <laughs> Um, and also, I, I disagree with the definition of infrastructure today. I have a new definition, and I think it's a better one. We, we, we tend to think of infrastructure only as the hard assets, roads, bridges, you know, that sort of thing. Yeah. In reality, I think that's part of it, but I think you also have to add technology, because if you don't have a, a modern electrical grid to provide downtowns with power and so on, Think about how much power um, companies use today because it's all computer driven. Let's be yeah. quite honest about it. Yeah. You need that global infrastructure so that you know a company in West Rubber Boots, Saskatchewan, can sell to people in Burma. You know, I mean, you've got to have those capabilities. Yeah. You know, high speed internet, everything. Yeah. You need to build great cities. What I call the creative aspects. You need your parks and your libraries and your museums and your outdoor spaces and your great places and spaces. Yeah. Uh, you know, so that to me is the new definition of infrastructure. Well, I'd, and, I'd also add in Gord nature. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I would include that as part of the creative. Yeah. And, and as, yeah. cause there's there's yeah. so many solutions to, yeah. to, to climate adaptation, Absolutely. climate mitigation yeah. that are going to yeah. have to be based yeah. on us protecting, enhancing, uh, yeah. Reintroducing, I, I agree with that completely. Yeah, nature, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. No, I think Michael, that that's a fair point. And and again, so much of how we're going to solve that in the future is going to be municipally driven. Yeah, it's going to be um, what towns and cities do on their streets with their buildings, how many trees they plant. All of those kinds of things are going to have a huge impact on Canada's ultimate reduction in greenhouse gases. Yeah. And and then uh, supporting, promoting, encouraging, and, and coaching homeowners to take advantage of yeah. uh, small parcels. And yeah. Every, yeah. every little bit's going to help. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And, and local f food security. That, I wrote a book about that, too. And That'll be another show, Gord. Well, okay, we'll we'll do that. But that's that's a big issue: is um, local food security, uh, the obesity rates, uh, particularly of children in this country, 
uh, how that impacts the health system through you know, a lifetime of diabetes and so on. These are really big issues. And uh, to their credit, uh, I gave a lot of speeches across the country about that when, I, when the book came out several years ago. And there are a lot of health units that are really now very invested in how they're improving that, how they're working with uh, families and kids. Uh, they are improving that, and, and I'm very happy to see that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so we've talked quite a bit about some lessons learned, but are there any other lessons learned, Gord, that uh, especially now, I think, post kind of coming out of COVID and post pandemic, that uh, that you could share with uh, with our mayors and our other communities who you know, you know we're, we're thriving as best we can, but obviously we're looking now for a, almost a renaissance, uh, you know, a, a rebirth uh, moving forward. Do you know, Michael, the thing that that has occurred to me coming out of if we are coming out of the COVID thing, and let's hope that we are, but in in this whole COVID experience the last year and a half. The thing that, that I keep coming back to is timid doesn't work. No. And you see it in communities where they kind of say, well, maybe you shouldn't go there and maybe we should have masks and so on. Remember, it was a year and a half ago um, with the, the, the senior health official in Canada saying, oh, masks aren't any good. Don't worry about those. That's stunning to think about today. But when you look at, frankly, some of the provinces, uh, we'll pick Alberta as the current example, because it is a an absolute mess uh, because they played political games. They wouldn't follow the science. They opened up the province for the summer. And now they are in a crisis where they're asking for the Canadian Army to come in and help them out. Uh, that is mismanagement at the absolute worst level. Uh, Premier Kenny, who to me is a dead Premier walking, but that's another idea that I have, uh, I think is an example of you can't have it both ways. And there are times leaders have to stand up and say, this is what is right for my people, for my city, for my province, for my country. And if I get voted out because I'm doing this, that's the way life is. But you gotta stand up and do what is right. And you can't play political games with people's health, with city's health, uh, and timid just doesn't work. If you're going to do it, you know, do the lockdown, get it over with, take yeah. the bad medicine, and then then move on again. And uh, to me, that is one of the really big lessons that people don't want to admit, but to me has come out of this. Yeah. And uh, back in my professional career, thank you for that, Gord, but back in my professional career, uh, dealing with a lot of committees on design projects, it was uh, it was a timid committee that always yeah. had the projects that were diluted. You know, they weren't, they weren't this, they weren't that. And they, yeah. As a consultant, it's my responsibility to, to produce the very best project that I can that, that uh, uh, answers the questions. And and uh, takes advantage of the opportunities and mitigates the the, the uh, negative aspects, but but you're right. It's it's timidity is is just debilitating. And I, uh, I, I, I'm not a real big fan of committees. <laughs> uh, They're a challenge at times. Yeah, yeah. I, I I would rather do task forces. Yeah. Oh, you know, that, that, that are created for a reason, and you know you get in you solve the problem and then you shut them down it's over yeah, yeah. uh and but committees go on and i'm just not a big fan yeah yeah well uh gord thank you so much for uh for spending the time with us today uh learned so much uh i'm still just getting through your first book of mine but uh looking forward to diving into the others and uh and watching 
uh, you know, you, the the work that you do. And are you still going to be doing some keynote speaking? Do you think? Yeah. Um, now, now that the world is kind of starting to reopen a little bit, um, I, I I'm not a I'm not a big fan of giving speeches online. Um, yeah. I I like to interact with the audience. I I like the repartee. I you know I like the spontaneity. But the um, energy. Yeah, and, and I feed off that. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. But uh, it has been a pleasure being with you, Michael. Thank you for inviting me. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. Maybe we can do it again sometime. Oh, I, th I think we're going to have to. We're already up at 50 minutes, so <laughs> uh, and, and uh, we barely scratched the surface. So thank you again, uh, Gord, so pleasure. much. Pleasure. Uh, everyone, please join us next week when Canada's newest senator, uh, Karen Sorensen, Senator K Karen Sorensen, uh, is, will be on the show, and she's recently just retired as the mayor of Banff, Alberta. So we're, we're going to have a really interesting conversation Ooh. with her as well. So have a great day, everybody, and we'll see you next week. Thank you for joining The Thriving Mayor Show. Make sure to like and share and tell your friends and colleagues. Mayors are awesome and are the change agents to enhance the quality of living for over 80% of us. Remember what Coach Wooden said, you cannot live a perfect day without doing something for someone who can never repay you. Much love and peace. Until next time.